everyone welcome to another episode of discovering the architecture middle path podcast uh, so during the last uh, episode we discussed about uh, business platform uh, as usual sanjeev is with me uh, hi sanjeev hi guys and we have two guests uh, as well uh, before introducing them a little bit uh, set the context about today's topic because we spoke about uh, business uh, service platform last uh, episode and then we were discussing about platform for a while in different uh, angles we thought of um, continue the discussion as a result we invited two guests uh, so sanjeeva uh, can you introduce uh, our first guest yes uh... my pleasure to introduce frank frank is uh, professor Hi. dr frank lyman he is the head of the institute for distributed systems at university of stuttgart before that he was at ibm for a long time where he led most of the workflow and various application development infrastructure and also before that was uh, one of the main architects of db2 related technologies and uh, at uh, stuttgart he is now one of the leading scientists on quantum computing Where he does a lot of work in quantum machine learning and various aspects of quantum computing, and he also happens to be a technology fellow in WSO two. And I have known Frank personally from I think nineteen ninety eight or something like that when we were both at IBM. Right. And he's been supporting and helping WSO two for a long time. So it's great to have Frank here. Welcome, Frank. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Sanjeev. Welcome, Frank. And our second guest is Gregor Hobbs. Uh, so Gregor, actually, I met Gregor during uh, enterprise integration uh, patterns era, like I think uh, maybe nineteen years before, and then after that, uh, Gregor yeah. authored many books, uh, especially targeting architects, the architecture elevator, and then um, uh, the application modernization side. And Gregor's latest book is about uh, uh, platform strategy. Uh, so Greg is an author as well as a, a thought leader in the industry, a well-known um, character. And uh, welcome, Greg, to the podcast. Yeah, um, a pleasure to be here. So, as I mentioned, uh, today's topic going to be about platforms. Uh, so, since uh, Greg, you uh, wrote the book, there should be a rational behinding behind writing um, a platform strategy book. So, why don't you start with the current uh, um, uh, like uh, staging about platform and why it is a hot topic? Mm. Yeah. So, platform is definitely a hot topic, and interestingly, I started writing the book about three years ago, and it took me. a while to get this done because it's also a complex and diverse topic as you guys discussed on on other episodes but uh, luckily for me the the topic hasn't hasn't stopped to be interesting and i think one of the key drivers is that the way we build modern software has become pretty amazing from an operational perspective right everything is in the cloud it's distributed asynchronous event driven like all these kind of properties we wanted for software we got right it scales it's resilient it's distributed like all these great properties we got but people also realize that building those things is complex right you sit on different environments you need to deal with distributed systems so platforms are seen right now as sort of the savior from complexity the idea is oh if i put a platform on top of something then the something becomes simpler but at the same time i don't feel constrained and that sounds a little bit like magic and i think it can be done but it's not as easy as it sounds but i think that is really the driver folks are looking for a complexity reduction a productivity increase due to that and perhaps also better governance you know sometimes put some guardrails around what's being built so those are the expectations let's say and why people talk about platforms so much Yeah, I completely agree with you. So I'm in the CTO club in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area, and I think every day, like this is the topic, like how we are building platforms and then uh, what are the problems. And even I was at uh, one of the application architecture conference few weeks back, and that was the hot topic as well. And that's one reason Sanjeev and I uh, was talking about this for a while. Yes, so I, I think um, something that we, you know, what we, what, what the sort of the technical purpose of the work I have been doing in my whole technical career now in about thirty-five years, has very much been on how do you give developers 
a better abstraction layer, a better infrastructure, uh, or a better platform to build on so that they focus on the part that they must focus on, which is creating awesome digital experiences, whether it's an API or an integration or web application or mobile app or a workflow or whatever the thing they want to create. But they are able to put the effort into that part and less on all the things that that they need to do or as well in order to be able to build and deliver that software. So this this you know there was this term called middleware which was popular for a very long time, uh, but we don't really talk about middleware anymore because middleware in that old sense where it was a different server that was running into which you deployed software is no longer yeah. there in in the Kubernetes containerized kind of era. Middleware is packaged with the software. But there is this still very strong layering of platforms that you need to have in order to facilitate the uh, every company in the world that wants to and needs to build some kind of software so that they can do that part and not have to go figure out how do I do everything related to software manufacturing from step by step that every other company has figured out also. So it's like, uh, you know, if you take an analogy, uh, you know, every every company, every business will use electricity, but most most businesses, unless you are an electricity manufacturing company, does not know how to manufacture so electricity. They plug in and it just flows in somehow, right? And when it doesn't work, you call somebody and say, "My electricity is broke," basically. <laughs> and that's what we need to get to computing platforms. Mm -hmm. Funnily, with solar now, many people do produce Going their own electricity. That's right, and they even store it's it right? and they put it back in here. Yeah. Come it's funny in. how those how those things go based on the constraints that are underneath. And I'm I'm yeah. only half joking, right? How much you build yourself versus how much you use depends a little bit, a on sort of what next platform down you sit on, yeah. and b what kind of capabilities you have. So electricity is a fun example that way. But you don't build your your uh, solar panels. Right, you just Correct. use them. Or the inverter or the again. batteries. You buy a solution, right? You put it together. It's a, yes, so buy a solution, solution yes. you own, but you know, you, you are conceptually generating the electricity, but you're really, you know, you, you are generating the electricity, but rather the sun is generating the electricity. Yeah. You, then, you went anyway. from the power socket to a component model. Yes. Right? You made out of solar cells <laughs> yes, and sure. inverter, right? And you have more flexibility. You need more yeah. capacity, you add another panel, right? So it's yeah. actually not such a poor analogy because yeah. suddenly you gain flexibility. And again, you're not starting from scratch, absolutely not, right? But you sort of have parts that you can work with and you have more flexibility, maybe also a tiny bit more complexity, right? And that's always the trade-off we're trying to, to bust through. Like, how do I retain flexibility, but how do I minimize the complexity that I need to deal with in order to get that flexibility? I think that is sort of, that's the dial we, we like to yeah. turn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another the, example, uh, yeah. sorry, Sankar, let, let me give one more example. Actually, the first time I heard about the, not uh, this sort of platform strategy as a way of building essentially a product line architecture, uh, because it, it, you can look at a company that produces a set of software and every business has many pieces of software because there's a lot of things to run the company, which is integrating various systems to the customer facing ones, the partner facing ones, the employee facing ones, and so on. So they, they then uh, if you look at a vehicle manufacturer, and the first time I heard about this was with Honda. When Honda was, uh, you know, Honda Accord, I think in late 90s, was like the number one selling car in the US. And they had a series of vehicles that they had built on the same core platform. Right. So a vehicle manufacturer doesn't build an entire vehicle infrastructure for each vehicle. So they have a core platform and on which now you put different sort of UXs essentially on top right. of that. Right. And maybe a little bit of more engine power, a little bit different wheel size. But the fundamental drivetrain, the infrastructure, obviously with electric vehicles and so on, that architecture is changing. But again, the, the idea was very much that if you're going to make 10 vehicles, you don't make 10 things top to bottom. Right? You have a base layer, which is really that business platform that Asanka and I talked about in the last episode, which is really that represents the vehicle manufacturing company's common infrastructure. And then you have specific things for each experience. You know, if you're driving a four-door four, four -door sedan, it's one experience. If you're driving a, a, a four-door minivan, it's another experience, etc. Mm. And it's even yeah, called the platform. It's even called the platform. It's even called the platform, right? Yeah. 
Correct. Yeah. yeah. And, and I use that example actually in my book because one of the, the fallacies we software people have is that we believe we invented everything because you know, we're always on the move and trying mm -hmm. new sure. things. But in this case, the idea is at least half a century old, right? The car manufacturer started this in the 70s actually originally. And we can learn quite a lot from that, right? The one thing you already mentioned, the, the purpose of the automotive platforms was not to standardize everything. They wanted to standardize some of the heavy engineering, like engines, transmissions, emission controls, anti-lock brakes, all those kind of things. But the purpose was to build more different models. And I think this is the first important message for folks you know, who in build in-house IT platforms. They always say, oh, we want guardrails, we want standardization, we, we want to sort of narrow the playing field. So the automotive manufacturers remind us the reason they made platforms is that they can have more variety, right? So the idea was commonality underneath, like harmonization in the base, but more diversity on top. And you can see that if you look at the large automotive manufacturers, whether Toyota, Volkswagen, BMW, whatever it might be, in the old days when I grew up, right, there was a BMW 3, 5, and 7, right, and that was it. And now they have over 30 different models and other brands similar. Right? And that can only be done because of a platform strategy. So we learn yeah. that the platform harmonizes one half, but the goal of that harmonization is to increase diversity and innovation on the other half. Right? It's not to make everything the same and uniform, but to have innovation and more variety. The, the second part we, we, we learn, right, coming back to our solar cells, is that the car manufacturers initially really started with two pieces, right? The platform at the top half, like it was really only top and bottom. And that was okay. That's how they made the Golf, Jetta, Passat kind of thing, right? Like hatchback, four door, like you said, but they all looked very similar in a way. They had the same lengths, you know, the same chassis, same engines. They just a little bit, you know, two doors, four doors, hatchback. But then over time, they broke the platform down into a component model just like the solar cells so the platforms became modular and that's what you know frank said that's what they really call the mlb the modular links baukasten i think is the term right it's the modular longitudinal toolkit so the component model in the end gave them much more flexibility and now they can build like cars that you would never think have the same platform underneath actually on it and the key to making that work is the component model so once you you drill in a little bit behind those stories, you can realize really important nuances and learn a lot about what it takes to make a good platform. Yeah, but you yeah, already okay. indicated it. It's very difficult to build a platform, right? You must be reliable, quality of service must be ensured. So building a platform is highly non-trivial, right? Yeah. That's what I want to point out. So it's, yeah, yeah. okay. And yeah, not every yeah. car owner, go ahead. I, I, think, I think that that component model aspect is very important. The, so. You know, in in a, in a, I think uh, some there was a recent Gartner or something uh, a story which said uh, the average company is now using 130 different SaaS systems. So think of them as 130 different API sets that they are able to consume, mm -hmm. and then they have mm -hmm. you know hundreds of other internal systems and APIs which are essentially uh, digital components, right? So getting that component abstraction is what allows you to create this multiple digital experiences, which is the analogy of in a vehicle platform. You have a set of components with which you can put together 30, 40, 50 different models and you know and, and hundreds of combinations of colors and seat choices and all these different things. And on the software side, again, that's the part that you want to get to, right? Where where you have a set of components with which you can build together new experiences, new applications. As the market evolves, as the trends come on, you can create different things. Yet you don't go figure out again how do I weld together? How do I tighten bolts together? How do I go and make something that flows they are correctly? All those things are, they just work. Mm. Yeah, it, I, Frank is absolutely right. So platforms are amazing, but making one isn't easy. So let's, maybe last time we stretched the car metaphor, basically they had sort of a 70 year or 80 year head yeah. start to even know their domain 
if you wish, right? Yeah. Like what makes a car? What are the pieces? What are they called? What are the variability points, right? Like what is common? What do you want to change? And then it took him another, let's say three decades about to go from the simple sort of the base and, and, and the piece on the top to really a modular platform that took them another three decades. So they have a hundred year cycle on really understanding the domain, really understanding what parameters are better fixed, right? And what parameters do people want to have variable? And to be honest, right, they build 20 or 30 models, right? And these are big investments. Now every company building their own platform also has us a little bit worried. Because just like Frank said, right, it's not easy to do that. And if you look at the history of IT, the big successful platforms are pretty far in between, like operating systems are great platforms, right? Highly, highly harmonized. We don't use a lot of operating systems, or but on top, we can do whatever we please, right? Then cloud platforms we have, maybe data platforms, but it's sort of like one every few decades or something that we can really say we have a fantastic example where this really works. So now every company going and saying, hey, I'm going to make my own in-house is indeed a little ambitious, I would say, just like Frank pointed out. Yeah, and another yeah, I think, uh, aspect, uh, Asaka. Yeah. Yeah, so I think uh, uh, you made a really good point there because the domain knowledge is very important. And one thing, one problem that we see in uh, the teams who's building platforms, they are mainly focusing on the delivery side of the platform and not focusing on the software engineering. Uh, so that's uh, where some of the platforms are not feature completed and then not that uh, user friendly for the users who are the developers who's working on top of the platform. Uh, sorry, Frank. Uh, uh, another interesting aspect from my perspective is that if we come back to the car again, the platform isn't seen. A customer doesn't buy a car because the platform is there, but because the color of the body is so nice and the shape of the body. So the platform is hidden, right? And this is something that I think uh, uh, Sanjeeva coined platformless. That's what I really like, right? The platform is there, but it's not the reason for buy something. You know, the customer experience, right? If I buy a car, is important. It's not the not the platform, and this is I think a very important uh, aspect that we need to discuss. I should continue to discuss. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we one, can we can stretch the car metaphor one more time there. In, in, indeed, yeah, yeah, history yeah, taught good. us exactly that lesson. So in the Ah, probably 80s, late 80s, early 90s, the US manufacturers had the idea of what if I make the platform ever bigger, right? Because the bigger my platform is, the less I need to do on top. So the economics would seem to be even better, yes. right? Because I don't need to do much. So the extreme version of that was called batch engineering. So basically the whole car was more or less identical and they just stuck a different logo on the back and they took this to the extreme and this has a name even is called the Cadillac Cimarron effect and it was a horrible car nobody remembers it except for the effect because basically what they did is they took a Chevy Cavalier also a horrible car and they put all the options in so it had like aircon power windows right whatever so they went down the whole options list right and said oh this is now a Cadillac and they stuck the logo <laughs> on the back giant failure like like abysmal failure because they they didn't respect what sits on top right they they tried to make the whole thing the platform they tried to make the platform visible using frank's word right and that is not the purpose of the platform and as soon as you do that you're likely in trouble and yes once again the car manufacturers already taught us that lesson many decades ago so, so I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring uh, uh, one more. Uh, I think we're killing this car analogy, but we can take one more <laughs> analogy of this one, which is that uh, um, there is one big difference, which is that there are only, you know, literally, you know, tens of car manufacturers in the world. Mm -hmm. It may, may be a few hundred at most. Whereas software manufacturing, you know, the the new tagline is every company is a software company. That means every company has to create software. Now, the super platforms would like it if they don't build anything, but just build everything on this one of these platforms in some fashion, whether it's Microsoft, Amazon, Google, or even Salesforce, right? Uh, but in general, 
you know, any meaningful size business will have Workday, will have ServiceNow, will have NetSuite, and there are uh, uh, other alternatives, right? I'm not picking these guys, but um, so as a result, it is not one one product, one one business, one platform ever. So in other words, what this means is every large business. Unlike the automotive case where you really have only 30, 40, 50, 70, 100 car manufacturers in the world, here you have hundreds of thousands of companies that will need a platform themselves. Mm -hmm. So they don't get the luxury of going through 70 years or 30 years of expertise building to create that platform. They have to leverage something because otherwise they're just gonna get it wrong because you can't go from being not having a platform to having a platform that disappears or a platform less experience by going, just saying, let me start from scratch and wire a bit of pieces together, right? That's just going to be a nightmare failure. I have, I have a going joke. Why so many companies are building platforms? And it's only funny because it's largely true is um, these days calling something a platform is the easiest way to get internal funding. Because Absolutely. it's going to solve all the problems, right? Yeah. It's like higher productivity, more compliance, you know, yeah. we need less skilled developers. And the people say, oh, fantastic. So here is funding. Go go and build this. I think that is at least partly the reason why we're seeing so many platform initiatives. Abstracting the problem by using the platform abstraction. So that's what they're trying to do. Yeah, but then the important question is that Asanka basically posed, how do you build application? Because you want to have added value. Building a platform for a food company is not contributing to the business. Right, so how do we build mm. this kind of yeah. application? So the, the there interesting a component thing is, is there, you, you know, need APIs maybe. in order to build that. That's, I think, is key. Yeah, yeah, sorry, there was a bit of delay. I, I, I jumped yeah. in. So yeah, so yeah. The, the thing is, um, milking the automotive manufacturers one more time, the economics of the platform are very good because they build mm -hmm. hundreds of thousands of cars on top of that platform, sometimes millions, right? So the economies of scale of the platform underneath are very good. And you could say the same of the large cloud providers, right? Whether it's you know, the, the Azure's Google Amazons or the, the ServiceNow's, um, you know, sales forces, right? Their, their, their economics of the base platform are very good because it's very widely used. Now, if you build one in-house, that's going to be very different, right? You're going to have maybe 10 teams, maybe 20 teams, maybe 50 teams if you're really lucky on this platform. Now, on one hand, you can say you also have a better starting point because you build on top of operating systems, you build on top of a cloud platform, probably you build on top of middleware, actually have fond memories of middleware, so I don't consider it such a bad thing, right? But you build on top of this so you have a better starting point, but at the same time, you need to be cautious, right? How many, how many teams can you actually accelerate and how much effort are you putting in the platform? And I think people need to carefully think about the, the economics of doing that. Yeah, I think uh, the <clears throat> platform architecture is one side, like how you get the architecture correctly. And then the technology choices, right? Because we have many choices um, on the table. So what are the correct technology choices that they are going to make? And another mistake that we see over and over, treating it as a project, not a product, and try to finish it within a, a fixed time frame and with a fixed budget. So uh, that's where I think uh, some of these organizations are struggling at the moment. Yeah, I, I think sadly, it's always easier to sort of discover the failure models, right? Because it's easier to see what's going wrong as opposed to recommending here is like the right way to do it, right? It's harder to put your finger on. Basically, in a way we're coming, the right way to do it is to not fall into the traps that all the other people fell into, which is a bit of a, you know, soft definition. The the, the one thing or like a couple of um, checkpoints I have for internal platform teams are the, the following, right? The first one is don't sort of rebuild what somebody else has already built, right? So people say like, oh, the cloud providers have fully managed databases, but for some reason, I want to be provider neutral. So I put my own database neutral interface on top. So I basically, I'm making a better database. And that generally doesn't work very well because 
A, it's hard, and B, you don't have the economics of, of, of building a better database, right? You should, you should build something that the cloud providers or the base platform providers inherently cannot, right? You should do something for your specific domain, specifically for your teams, like don't recreate something that somebody else can already build because economically it's, it's just totally not viable. The, the other advice I give, the second piece of advice I give is that um, the idea of having common layers isn't new, right? If I look at any IT architecture strategy, there's always like the pyramid, the triangle picture, right? The big base layer, then the more specific layer and the developers only need to put the cherry the cherry on the cake, right? Kind of thing. The idea is not new. The problem is that always looked good on paper, but in reality, it's been very difficult. And I think the reason that has been so difficult is because that model, like that pyramid model, assumes that you can anticipate all needs. Like it assumes you can anticipate all use cases. That's how you build this giant base. And on top, people just have to set a certain flag, like the color, right? And the application is, is done. And we realize that anticipating all needs doesn't work very well for two reasons. The one is like, A, you would have to be incredibly smart. And B, even if you are that incredibly smart, things change, right? You want innovation, you want new ideas. So even if you anticipated everything today, tomorrow you'll be wrong. And in a way, it's good that you'll be, be wrong because that's what innovation means, right? So what I try to tell people, it comes back, it comes back to Asanka's point, right? It's like, if you think of this as a project, you have the base it's assumption that you know all the requirements right? You build all the requirements and then you're done. And then people just have to put the little cherry on the cake. And that is fundamentally flawed. So the good checkpoint of an in-house platform is that have people build something on top that you didn't anticipate. Like have they done more than you could have foreseen? And I think that is a really, really good test for leaving people the room for innovation, for creativity, by seeing that they have done something that you hadn't actually anticipated. And I find that to be a helpful guideline for people to not recreate the pyramids that we know don't work as well. So again, what, what we are saying is a note of caution. It's not a project that ends after a couple of months or a few years. It's a continuous effort. And if you so if you want to build your platform by yourself, be aware it takes a long time, many, many years, continuously think about it, whether you, whether you want to spend the money or go to a platform that already does exist, right? That's what Asanka and you are saying, Gregor. Co correct. And I think there's a more yes. punchy way of saying is basically the platform effort ends when the platform dies. Like, like, a, platform <laughs> vendor, like, like a platform vendor will stop working on the platform when they're out of business. I like it. Right? I like it. Go, go. So, so I think there's a... Uh, uh, there's another part to this which we haven't touched yet, which is that a platform is a, is an abstraction layer. You know, mm -hmm. Computer science is all built on abstractions. And if you design an abstraction that whose fundamental orthogonal characteristics are correct, it scales. The best example going back many, many years in the Unix architecture was the open read write close interface for devices. It was originally designed for files and scaled to networks, scaled to all kinds of device types, and it just works, right? Very simple for API call, and it just works. So like that, Kubernetes has cracked another layer of platform abstraction, and it's held up really well, right? Kubernetes, again, came from a lot of experience from two, uh, actually recently, uh, Brian uh, had written, Brian is one of the main original Kubernetes creators, had written a blog about uh, the, at the, as remembering the first 10 years of Kubernetes kind of thing and how it started. And it came from Borg and some other stuff that they had done. So they had experience. From that experience, they created this set of abstractions about containers, about pods, about deployments, about namespaces, all these things. And those abstractions have been right. That is, there has not been a use case where you can't deploy onto that. Now, that doesn't mean every system should be deployed into a Kubernetes kind of ephemeral deployment architecture, but it has uh, the fundamental abstractions have been right. So like that, I think the key thing to being a successful platform is figuring out what is the problem that you're trying to solve, what is the level of abstraction you're trying to raise it to, and getting that abstractions foundations in an orthogonal way so that you can combine it and create whatever you want as long as you're staying within the 
the n dimensional space of that the, the base design then it works and you don't have to worry about whether i can do this use case and that use case and this other use case so of course that's very difficult right. that's an art form that's experience that's luck probably correct and a lot of feedback and learning cycles because i mean yeah. we are comes back a little bit to, to Frank's point, right? How difficult really is this? So even Kubernetes, you would say the, the sort of the biggest criticism in a way is that, yes, it's super flexible. You could do on top pretty much whatever you want, but people also feel that there's a lot of complexity left. So, right? It's not easy. So people wish, people wish you had gotten rid of more complexity without constraining. And this tells us how difficult this really is to do. Like, I mean, my, my favorite example is still Unix, right, and Unix pipes, like in the end, you need composability, you need a collection of components. So you need a component model with a good domain language, right, like something that tells you what all the pieces are, and then they need to be easy to put together into new solution. Now, you know, I work for a cloud provider, so we use the Lego analogy a lot. But my, my slightly cynical joke is, right, my two Lego blocks never fell apart because I didn't send the, I set the identity and access management settings correctly, right? So the, the reality of composing solutions in software is a lot harder than sticking two Lego blocks together. And I would say most of us have a, a pretty long history in integration, so we could make the argument here that part of a successful platform is that it's easy to integrate within itself right to compose the platform but also like like sanjeeva said right like you have hundreds or sometimes thousands of of, of SaaS products already existing so the platform also needs to integrate easily with the remainder of your organization because not everything will be on the platform so perhaps the statement we find is hey building successful platforms really is an integration problem mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it has to integrate well as well as it has to, it has to securely integrate because when it comes to an enterprise, uh, security is kind of a really uh, important thing. And uh, when you connect with these many components uh, and then outside the uh, platform ecosystem, uh, so that's going to be a critical part as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And one more thing to highlight since Sanjeeva brought Kubernetes uh, uh, into the conversation, I think uh, one reason why platform has become a hot topic, again, the complexity uh, that comes with Kubernetes as well, because running a Kubernetes uh, cluster in production grid, it's really difficult. That's, uh, that's why a lot of uh, organizations are struggling and they try to abstract it by using a, a platform. So. Uh, that's something that we have seen in inside these organizations as well. Yeah, we, we always feel we can do better, right? And that's where some respect for Kubernetes, I would say, right? Like yeah. 10 years history and has moved the industry forward a lot. The temptation is always, we feel we can do better ourselves. And and there's an interesting, interesting fallacy, an interesting effect in this, um, where if you build something yourself, you learn while the complexity grows, right? You start with something simple, yeah, because you're starting from more or less from scratch. So it's easy to understand, but over time, it will grow more and more complex. But to the teams who build the things themselves, it doesn't seem that complex because they grew up with it. So if somebody right. new comes in the organization and says, oh, this is really complicated. And then people go like, no, this makes total sense. It's completely simple. But to them, it seems simple because the complexity grew along with them. And I think this is an easy trap to fall into where you're saying, hey, my thing is so much simpler, but it isn't actually simpler. It just seems simpler because you've seen it grow up. And then it will not scale when you're trying to get more developers on it, if you're trying to hire new people. Um, I actually have that firsthand experience from my old Silicon Valley days at, at Google, right? Where admittedly we built one of the more clever platforms like Borg, right? Sanjeeva mentioned where Kubernetes count and the stuff was fantastic. I loved it. But new developers we hired, like top-notch developers would come in and like, what the heck, 
right? They would just come in and see all the stuff we have from like big tables and Borg and Zazals, right? And it was amazing, but it was also a bit of a shocker, right? For the new folks. So this is another trap that's easy to fall into. The stuff that you grew up with will always seem easier to you than looking at a third party product, which might actually be simpler, but to you, it feels more complex, easy, easy trap. Yeah. But again, so what, 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 what I hear us saying is complexity, the platform is damn complex. Why should I build it myself? Because all that I want to focus on is software. My company should become a software company. What are the application components, the APIs? How do I compose them? Give it them on the platform. I would like to build added value to my customers. So the platform should be hidden. I don't want to see it. I would like to have components, composable components, right? And then what is the need to integrate them? Do we need a programming language? Do yeah. we need tools to, to compose APIs or cells or what the hell we are going to build our components out? Yeah, yeah. so I, I, th right. I think it's important. I think that, that point about Kubernetes and complexity. And the thing is, Kubernetes was designed to solve a set of problems. And mm -hmm. one problem in our industry is we take something that solves one set of problems really well, and we try to generalize it to solve all problems. Mm -hmm. And Kubernetes, the problem Kubernetes really so solves really well is the problem of taking a set of physically distributed infrastructure, getting it into a single management platform so that you can deploy and operate software on that. But it wasn't meant to be necessarily how every developer should write a piece of code that runs on that. Right. And that's where we fail because we often tell people, oh, we are using Kubernetes, so go learn Kubernetes in order to write a piece of code now. This is completely wrong because why do I have to learn Kubernetes in order to write a piece of code? I know how to write a piece of code already. And the, the, that's where, again, the platform abstraction matters. So if you just give Kubernetes as the abstraction to developers saying, this is your development abstraction, then you have these horror stories of 20,000 lines of YAML describing what you're trying to deploy, and right? Whereas if you say, look, we are using Kubernetes underneath because Kubernetes is a beautiful platform for deploying, operating, and managing a set of software, but you have to design then what's the developer experience for how they write a piece of code, get it compiled, built, and delivered on the underlying infrastructure. So again, it's that layers mm -hmm. of abstraction. So I view it as Kubernetes abstraction layers from the point of view of abstracting storage, networking, infrastructure. Uh, you know, I, I, if you go back one year before, it was EC2, it was these other kind of abstractions, right? The AMI, all of that. Now we have yep. Docker images, some kind of a container image, and this new set of abstractions. That solves that layer really well. But then we need to build the next level, which lets you develop code and operate and reuse and so forth, so that you can get to the level Frank was just talking about which is really at the business level, why do I care about any of these things? I'm an insurance company. What I need are a set of APIs that lets me build the applications that I need to build. Right? And so, so these are these sort of layers of abstraction that you have to build. And of course, the challenge with abstractions is abstractions can leak. And if they leak, you have a really nightmare, messy design. And that's what Kubernetes has got right. It doesn't leak much. There is always something that leaks, but it's really good at abstracting hardware and networking at up to a certain level. So the software development platform on top of that also must create some set of abstractions that let you operate at that level so that you can go up the food chain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think the, the precondition there is we need to understand the next layer of the domain very well. Right? Like each good abstraction has brought a very nice domain language. And in many cases, the language is, is so natural that we don't even think about it, right? Coming back to your um, operating system IO example, like streams, right? Like get next byte, right? We don't think about this as a, as a domain language, but in terms of how much complexity a stream hides, right? In terms of disk sectors, file systems, right? Network IO, packets, switching, routing, right? Like it's amazing how much it hides, but the language on top, like what is a stream? You open, you read, you close, right? Is basically so simple that it worked. And that was, to me, that's domain driven design. So to yeah. do, Sanjeeva, what you say, right? To go to the next yeah. level, to not make Kubernetes be the next level, but actually define the next level, folks really need that domain 
vocabulary, right? And I think generally yes. as developers, we get sort of mediocre grades for that. And then what we do is we fall back on resolving the same problems or we fall back into the technical layer, just like you said, because we find that getting into the next domain layer actually turns out yes. to be very difficult. Yeah. Uh, Sanjeev and I spoke about this uh, in a previous episode as well, like how to get the domain driven design and how should the platform should enable it because now you can come up with a design, but if uh, it is not uh, supporting in the platform to implement it, uh, then it's going to be an issue. And there's a team topology coming there as well uh, in an organization. Uh, these teams are organized according to these domains. So how platform can facilitate it uh, is another angle that we have to take a look. Yeah, team topologies, of course, is a, is a, is a great um, hook into this. The, the one part that I really like because they really popularized the word of the, the, the platform team, the book yeah. cleverly stayed away from trying to define what the platform really is. So, so we, we have a lot of work left to do. But one thing that I really like from team topologies is the concept of uh, a thinnest viable platform. Right? And this goes back to some things that both Frank and Sanjeeva said is like an in-house platform doesn't have to be this giant piece of software that you build, right? If your goal is to, to harmonize, to increase productivity, to make things easier and faster for people to build, a piece of documentation can do that. It's like, hey, here's the default setup or here's the way we build software that can already achieve part of that. And so that is a good reminder that a platform doesn't have to be a giant piece of software that you operate, but it can come in various different forms and shapes. And in team topology speak, that is called the thinnest viable platform. So I always encourage teams to kind of know what you're after, right? That's been a theme we had many times now. Know what you're, which needle are you really looking to move? And then be very creative about what are different ways to move that needle because the software folks will always fall into, oh, I need to build something, right? But sometimes you don't have to build anything and you can still achieve some of the benefits that you know, a platform would normally be after. Yeah, so I think, uh, so another thing that uh, sometimes these platform teams, they uh, forget about the end user. Uh, that's a developer, right? Uh, because something that we see, they engineer these platforms based on what they think as a platform engineering team, not uh, the uh, end user looking for. So that developer experience and how they can increase the productivity of the end user is something these teams should consider. Uh, and it's a missing link in uh, some of these exercises. I, I think that's a very important point because you know a developer uh, has a life cycle they go through when they develop software and they operate software and they improve software. That life cycle shouldn't be delivered to them with different UIs and UXs that are different for each stage of the life cycle. Right? You can't, I mean, yes, you can, if you have to do it, it's a job, you do it. But it's not an environment where the developer says, okay, my emotional and psychological commitment is for the part that I write and less on this other stuff if you have it like that. So the developer experience is really important. Yeah, and I, I see that mistake being made a lot and for probably a couple of reasons. The one is a lot of platform initiatives I see in enterprises tend to be driven out of sort of the infrastructure and operations side because you're looking for a common base layer yeah. of sorts, right? Like development is on top and the platform thing is underneath. So the teams that used to be the base layer is infrastructure and operations. And you know, let's be honest, they're usually not the folks who are the greatest at developer experience and user interface design, right? They say like, oh, look, you just got this thing here and isn't this great? And the answer is most of the time it's, it's not great. And the, the reason that is so important is that high friction is or high onboarding friction is the death of any platform right the platform has a certain scale effect so if it's difficult to get on a platform right it's hard to get users on and you know in the end you won't achieve your goals now in the enterprise you're always tempted to like oh i can mandate the platform but that is of course totally going to backfire so a good developer experience 
is a critical element of a successful platform because it reduces the onboarding friction. Like if you build a platform and basically the manual to use your platform is longer than the cloud provider's documentation, you probably didn't achieve anything in terms of reducing complexity, right? It should be easier to use and easier to deal with. And yeah, just like Asanka, I, I see this go wrong all the time. Yeah. But isn't then the ultimate question, who is the, who is the developer? Who is the user? Is it the traditional software engineer or is it the business user? The person who understands the business, what the customers like, right? So it's, it's hard to come up with the right UX with a developer experience because we need to focus what, who is the developer? What is a business mm. person or is it really a, a computer scientist or a programmer? Yeah, great Any ideas question. On and yeah, I, I, mean, I think the whole yeah. low code, no code is aiming yes, that absolutely. direction, right? The citizen, yes, citizen developer. One, right? the, 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 what my observation there is a little bit though, so this comes back to what we talked about Kubernetes, right? Like how mm -hmm. much flexibility can I have and how much complexity can I get out? And I find that the no code, low code went a little bit the other extreme, right? They said like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to minimize the complexity, yeah. but I'm willing to compromise on the flexibility, right? So they end up being very narrow. They end up being easier and less complex, but they often ended up being very narrow. And the problem is if your platform is narrow, they have harsh, they can have sharp edges. Like basically, if you need something that is outside of the platform, you sort of fall off the cliff basically. And that's the challenge I see there, but it's a really important question, right? Um, if I build an in-house platform, this shouldn't be for a Kubernetes user developer, right? Because that's already done. I don't need to recreate that. I should aim higher, right? I should aim for somebody who's closer to yeah. the business, but I should achieve that without trying to anticipate all use cases because I won't mm -hmm. be able to because I'm not the business user, right? Yeah. And I think once again, getting that balance, I see a lot of folks trying and I think it's good we're trying because the answer isn't obvious at all. So mm -hmm. I, I think again, you have to be very careful because if you go back to, you remember the 4GL era, Right, mm -hmm. you know, Oracle Forms was a, a great way of building applications. You just have to write the logic inside the database. You put a form together, and and you know there are so many companies yet whose entire business workflows are written in Oracle Forms. So that that abstraction layer is very important. Otherwise, you get into this really messy sort of architectural level. So so while you right. need, you do have sort of pro code and low code and no code layers of um, composition let's say, you can't get rid of that sort of pro code layer because you do need to write the atomic functions that you're going to compose. Correct. So it is definitely important to have the higher level composition layers around and, and you, can't, you can't do without them. But it's very difficult to, um, it's not a good idea in general to say, look, my business is going to depend completely on, on just putting things together because then you have a very limited flexibility that you can operate with. Correct. You will you will suffer in Agreed. two ways, right? The one is flexibility, right? Again, you're building the pyramid like the Cadillac Cimarron, right? Like yeah. we know that doesn't doesn't work. The other one is operational considerations, right? You can make things easy to compose, but if they run as a distributed model, which SaaS applications inherently are, which money cloud applications, which container applications are, is you can make it easy for someone to build it, but then it might not be easy to operate, right? And as I said, we all come out of integration. So we know about back pressure and queues filling up and time to live, right? And all these kind of constructs that make a distributed system function. But those are not the things, not the things that we would normally include in a low code, no code environment, right? They're definitely very heavy duty, like operational aspects. And that's what I, I see often come back to bite people. Even if you manage to get the domain pretty well, right? To get that to a good level, don't forget the operational aspects of a distributed system. Like, But, but if, if I have to think about it, then the platform is wrong. I build my ah. application, I build my component, and I put it into the platform. The platform should take care. Mm. Isn't Very it? Very interesting. 
Very interesting question. And I'm actually thinking about this very close to home for me because I'm building serverless stuff for AWS, right? And I just wrote a blog post where I was sort of contemplating whether serverless really just shifted one complexity to another complexity. Like serverless is the, the ultimate of you know, reducing server management complexity and classic infrastructure complexity, right? Basically, just like platformless, you don't see any of it, you don't deal with it. But what we find is a lot of um, developers who build, you know, sophisticated serverless applications very much need to deal with a fine-grained, asynchronous, event-driven kind of application. So you're not dealing with servers anymore, but now you're dealing with queues and back pressure and all those kind of things. And my argument was exactly this. It's like, oh, did we really trade one complexity for another complexity? And yes, the rhetorical question is, oh, shouldn't the platform be in such a way that I don't have to deal with Think this. about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With a distributed system, I find that to be hard. Quite honestly, internally, we debate this a lot, where on one hand we say, can I make these things just like disappear? But my view is on this, like if you build a distributed system, it's hard to pretend those things don't exist. Like like Sir San Sanjeeva said, right? The 4GL stuff didn't do, do so well. And all our approaches at distributed object kind of things who say it's distributed, but don't worry about it. Historically, they also haven't done, they haven't done very well. So I'm more in the camp of expose it to the people, but make it easier to deal with. But admittedly, that's also still a work in progress on my end. Uh, but, but again, complexity doesn't go away. We know this since decades. The only question is who has to cope with the complexity? But where, who has to solve it? Yep, you can shift it from one part to yes. the other. And sometimes yes. you can shift it successfully. Like admittedly an operating system, let's you know, stay with the streams example. You shifted a lot of complexity of disk sectors and network packets and all this stuff. You shifted that in a low layer and that abstraction holds 99% of the time, unless you're super performance critical, right? If you do like real time trading, right? You wanna know about packets and packet routing most other people don't. So there are ways where you can shift the complexity in a good place. But I come back to sort of our experience of we seem to be able to do that like once every two decades or so, which we, okay. we probably want to speed that up. So, mm -hmm. so I, I, this, you know, to me, this is, this is what makes what this kind of work interesting. The fact that these oh, yeah. problems don't have simple, straightforward answers. The fact that they require a lot of art form and you know iteration right and even even building a platform requires iterative thinking iterative architecture because you just mm -hmm. can't get this stuff right then of course then you then people look at you and say well come on i mean this is like nothing works out of the box the first time but then it, so my, my cop out for that is you know civil engineering has been around for thousands of years and still bridges fail buildings fall all kinds <laughs> of things go wrong right so so we've only been around for what 75 years or so of, of digital engineering so, you know, we got a few more years left before we can be considered like, you know, once you do it, it just works. So I think getting these abstractions right, this is critical. And same thing in other forms of engineering. The thing that has worked is the underlying mathematics and the mathematical abstractions that allow people to not think about low level problems. And I think that touches on quantum as well. I mean, that's what quantum is building on on some of this next generation of abstractions. So maybe we can get Frank to talk a little bit about like kind of the way you think about in that era as you know, where, where are we going to go? Because you know, all, all this stuff is evolving rapidly and, and, and yet slowly. Extremely complicated because people are begin to think about how to use quantum computers in their enterprises. The programming model, completely different. It's complex linear algebra, right? And the layers of abstractions, they are currently evolving. Right, so we still don't know how to build application. They are all handcrafted by specialists, right? So yeah. how to program the assembly them language, either, right? Yeah. Uh, yes. We, yeah. In, and yes. I would so, say yeah. the same. If you want to be critical, the same is still somewhat true for serverless applications. <laughs> like if if you look at like cloud formation, like you you joked about the two thousand lines of YAML, right? That is still kind of assembly language type of stuff, and that's been around for for over a decade now, right? And we're still struggling with getting out of the assembly language. So I would say with quantum, that will take us some time. And 
the, the ground rule is you cannot say quantum if you don't say AI. So maybe AI will solve all this for us, but I'm not so sure either. Yeah, but again, the dominant, a, yeah. the dominant programming language in quantum is cousin quantum assembler, right? So we are at the <laughs> assembler level, right? Yeah. So at least you're honest about where, where you're at. Absolutely, right? absolutely. Yeah, I think, Gregor, you touch based on AI. If you don't talk about AI, I think uh, uh, it's something missing. Uh, so uh, uh, we see like uh, organizations are looking platform as a vehicle to address two things. One is how they can build AI based applications uh, on top of the platform. And another thing, how uh, they can increase the productivity of the developers and control it uh, uh, through the platform capabilities. Basically, how you can bring uh, AI augmented uh, software engineering uh, into practice uh, using the platform. Yeah, so, so if anything runs the risk of slowing down the platform initiatives, it's AI because all <laughs> the attention shifted from one to the other in the funding, right? Um, we, of course, every customer I visit, right, they have, you know, Gen AI, um, developer assistance, you know, kind of thing. So, and I think it can move the needle on, on many aspects, like parts that your Frank mentioned, right? The, the more business user, the more conversational programming models, right? I think AI is really shifting the needle and assisting people and making developers yes. more productive. Now, there's sort of two parts to being productive, right? The one thing is getting stuff done. The other one is getting the right things done, right? Like not producing random yes. stuff, but producing software that's maintainable, that's reliable, right? And I think that part AI isn't quite going to do for us. So coming back to the vocabulary, right? I can have a conversational programming model, and that might simplify many things for me because I don't remember I don't need to remember all this nasty syntax. So you take JavaScript, for example, right? I don't need to remember all these operator overloading and precedences, right? Like conversational programming makes that much, much easier. Yes. But the domain language, like how do I express what I want to do? What is the vocabulary I, I use? What does the resulting code look like? What are the, the nouns and the verbs in there? I don't find AI solving that as easily for us, right? I think there's still a lot of work left, right? That's what Sanjeeva calls the abstraction, right? Like what are the words you use to describe the next layer? I think that we have to do. And then the AI is really good at dealing sort of with the noise around it, like composing things, syntax, all like the, the little sort of annoying stuff. But I see them as a combination of both. So I, I, I have I have strong reservations about uh, the Nelson Wang's uh, the the Nvidia CEO's commentary about English is or English or German or you know R Russian or Spanish or Sinhalese or whatever or Tamil is the next programming language because I think one of the reasons uh, and I and I've been involved with designing Ballerina so when you design a language you have some abstractions you're trying to capture into that language and you're trying to find the most developer natural way of expressing the abstraction in the language and when you explain that thing in a document in english if you read the ballerina spec now james who's the author of the ballerina spec uh, he's a very precise thinker his english is very very tight so even then when we go from the spec to the implementations it's always back and forth saying what did you mean here right so so uh, so this idea that everybody suddenly become a beautiful writer in English, let's just stick to English as one language, and that the computer is somehow going to understand what we mean is complete nonsense because I can send you a simple email and you can understand something completely different from what I said. Oh, I get a right? lot of those emails. Yes, I don't understand exactly. Any. Right? So, so, so the point is this, <laughs> this idea that, that, that right? <laughs> conversation, <laughs> conversational communication can express things which must be precise. You know, this, this recording software, this conversation we are having, the tools we are using can't be vague. It's got to be absolutely precise about every little detail. And mm. this was the, you know, the old fallacy of waterfall software design, that you could write a requirements document and you get it implemented and it works. And it never works. Right? Because what I wrote and what I meant are two different things. And then what you read and what you understood are two different things. So there's so, so many disparities. So, so I'm I think, not I think as negative... Are, 
Okay, okay. Well, Go well, I mean, maybe, okay, so German is a much more precise language from my understanding. No, 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 than, no, no. But no, no. it can be very tough, I think, to get right down uh, for a way no, no, no. to so, actually... I, I, so I, I'm not as, as negative as you are. So my experiments have been, I, I wrote a lot of BPMN programs by natural language, right? So you, pres you try to be precise, say exactly how the process should go and it generates yeah. very nice BPMN. But you can iterate. So if you get a nasty or not, not a nasty, if you get an imprecise email, you can ask back or if the four of us are no, discussing, right. we can ask back this. So the first time you are not exactly precise, but by iteration, you get more and more precise. And I think but this Frank, is a new you, kind you, of style. True, but you knew that the BPMN program wasn't, wasn't precise because you understand BPMN. If the whole point is that you don't you're need right. to understand BPMN, right? Then you find yes, that right. it's not precise because your customer calls and what the hell are you telling me, right? Agreed. That's not a good yeah. experience, right? That's not a good way to test. Uh, would... you're right. So anyway, so that, that's one part. The other point is on intelligence. I think, again, related in platforms and intelligence. If you look at the human, human intelligence and the human body, to me, I view the human body as kind of the platform. It's the thing that the intelligence is orchestrating. Mm -hmm. But you need that platform to orchestrate. Right. If, the, if, the, if the platform wasn't there, you know, right now I, my knee is not doing very well. I can't play basketball as much as I want to play. But, you know, the brain, the, the intelligence can't reprogram that platform. That platform has a bug in it now. Right. So I need to fix it somehow. So, <laughs> so like that, the AI versus the platform, I think platform engineering and the platform experience, the intelligence comes to me above a certain level of abstraction. Yep. Then it can orchestrate these things and do beautiful things like yep. what we can do as human beings. Yeah, I think so that building that is what's going to be the challenging part, getting that right yep. so okay. that intelligence can operate on the right tools, not on the wrong tools. Yep, you need the base. correct. Yes. You need the base yes. layer, right? You need that vocabulary that then, yes. because I would say language is grammar and vocabulary, right? And I think AI can help a lot with fixing the grammar, right? And we have things yeah, like right. Grammarly and other tools to do yep. that. But if the vocabulary is fuzzy, it still makes no sense, right? If I say foo yeah. and it means different things to you. So having the, the base layer of the platform that gives you the vocabulary, I think is equally important. And that is really domain design, right? That is describing your domain and having you know, precise terms that mean certain things like, like they do but, in outside of IT, right? If you go into the legal domain or the engineering domain, right? Certain words have very precise meaning and i think ai is not gonna sort of make that go away and if we want to go into new domains right like you know sajiva and many other folks are looking to do right getting that vocabulary is an important first step and once that is good then the ai on top probably can help you a lot sort of deal deal with a little little annoyances but it doesn't substitute for somebody building that that base platform i fully well, agree there it's a mental model, then we need more ontologies. Going back to the semantics guys, build ontologies, domain ontologies, and then if we teach that to the AI, then we can be more precise. Yeah, I mean, it feels a little bit like we're revisiting all the failed approaches of the past, <laughs> <laughs> like from, from flow GLs to ontologies to distributed objects. But at the same time, right, I, we joked with the solar panels at the very beginning. I think some of the approaches that failed in the past have better odds of succeeding if you made progress on certain constraints. They might not have failed in the past because they were a fundamentally bad idea, but they might have failed because something else wasn't in place. Yeah. So having, right. having the ground shift in a way, in a, in, in a good way, having progress at the base, I think might make it worthwhile yeah. revisiting you know, some of these approaches. And I would yeah. say, yes, ontology I mean, is, and, is part okay, of I, it. I, I fully agree. Yeah. And, and the best example of that is probably what we call AI or LLMs. <laughs> Because LLMs are, yes. in many sense, not intelligent. Okay, this is not universal agreed opinion, but it's not intelligent at all. It just has remembered everything that was said in some form and then just calculating yeah, okay. the probability, which was not possible if not for hardware, memory, all these other aspects. The fact that you could process that large volume of data, you couldn't do it 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So they were yeah. in a failed approach at that time as this is nonsense. This is not, never going to work. But just sit on it for 20 years and boom, it works. Mm -hmm. right. And as an architect, that's what's very interesting to me, right? Sort of what are the constraints where something else ran into 
limitations and have some of these constraints sufficiently weakened that I can now revisit things. I went to an interesting talk in London by a gentleman who said, like, if you're building an average enterprise application, like how much data do you have? Like how much processing do you really need? And then he said, look at the modern server spec. If you buy a heavy duty server, half terabyte of RAM, no problem, right? 128 cores, no problem. Now you look at your average enterprise application is like, do you have more than half terabyte of sort of operational data? Yeah. Probably not. So yeah. just write the whole thing in memory, write a transaction log yeah. on disk for recovery, yeah, absolutely. run the whole thing in memory, Done. nothing distributed, you have yeah. enough cores in this yeah. one box, and here is your happy monolith, yeah. right? And mm -hmm. this was a bit trying to be provocative, yeah. but it was exactly doing this of saying, hey, the constraints of hardware size have become you know, high enough that you can now reconsider, just run your thing yeah. in one box. I, I think that's yeah, also that's, I mean, we, we, that's, that's a very important point that, that even though we have all these tools and capabilities for distributed systems and all this integration, the more pieces that you break it up into so that you can recompose orthogonally in various forms, the more complexity you bring. So starting with a monolith is actually quite a good practice mm -hmm. for most yes. people because most people don't need this crazy capacity. So there are, there are you know, as, as usual with architecture, it's not a black and white answer. It's very much uh, depends answer yep and this is probably when in some way apis and SaaS is is super useful but it's also leading us down a little bit dangerous path because in the yep. end and serverless is the same thing the way i've said it is basically they they tend to couple the functional model with our runtime model so if i need another mm -hmm. piece of functionality right. yeah. i get another SaaS or another container or another thing so that means my operational model has also another node now which maybe yes. i didn't really want so my slogan is what if I want the capability, but I don't want the distributedness? And many modern approaches coupling the two, and I see that as a little bit dangerous because when I build something that is functionally nicely structured, it becomes operationally difficult because each piece of function translates into runtime elements. So decoupling functional or capability composition from runtime composition, I think is something where we should think more about. I think uh, we brought it to a really good place to end the episode uh, because one purpose of this, uh, I think the main purpose of this episode, uh, the podcast is to find the architecture middle part as well. Uh, so uh, uh, it was a very informative and a very interesting conversation. Uh, thanks, Greg and Frank uh, for joining us. Uh, Sanjeev, would you like to add anything at the end? Yeah, guys, thank you very much. It was a fun conversation and we could go on for hours. I have 10 more things <laughs> I can bring in, but I think we can wrap it up. But uh, thank you very much. It was really nice to have you uh, join us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Remind everyone, you for joining and listening. And we'll come up with another interesting topic. Uh, stay tuned. Thank you.